we believe that this message will be a blessing to you so I want you to stay glued and watch to the end and share to bless others this is Christocentric we have a lot of Apostle Eric Nyamiche's message on our platform kindly check them out thank you for watching stay blessed you have been anointed how many of you have been anointed fine we have all been anointed but the anointing is for a reason the anointing is for a cause the anointing is connected to the holy spirit and to the day of pentecost and pentecost fell for a reason so if you are anointed then i want you to know that god has given you that anointing for a cause that anointing for a cause in luke chapter 4 verse 18 and 19 jesus said the spirit of the lord is on me because he has anointed me too so the anointing is always for a cause he has anointed me too so we have been anointed for a cause to proclaim good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free so in the anointing is the setting free there is going to be an opposition somebody has been bound but you have been anointed to set free you have been anointed to open eyes and bring the good news to the poor how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Peter says, with the Holy Spirit and with power. He didn't end there. And he went about doing good, working with the anointing, working with the anointing. See, brothers and sisters, what you are feeling that you are calling anointing is just a stirring of the spirit within you. Otherwise, you have been anointed already. All of us here, the day you were born again, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, the anointed one. And you have the anointing. You have the anointing. It is within you being plentiful. And the anointing is for a purpose. So if God is stirring the anointing within you, what that means is that he's begging you to move. He's begging you to move. I saw this lunatic. When I traveled outside recently, we were using Redeem Church's auditorium for a retreat because it was very close and it was spacious than what we have. And then when we closed, I saw this lunatic standing behind a window, listening, paying close attention to what was being said from the house now the redeemed people were having service so when we finished they were also having this in a small one of their small rooms and i saw this lunatic i was shocked with surprise he was listening he is begging for someone to bring deliverance and nobody seems to mind him ah, but he was listening to the words that were being said from the house people need the lord there is no need to brag that christ is in us when people need the lord and they are not finding him they are not finding him second corinthians 1 verse 21 this was said by the revered apostle paul then i want us to if it can be projected for us to engage the scripture now, now means now. It may not have been, but now. It is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. Let's read the last line. He anointed us. Full stop. Yeah. So when you say the apostle Paul is anointed, there will not be any argument against it. But when we say you are anointed, you may even rise against that. But he anointed us, Paul and the church. Once we give ourselves to Jesus, he has anointed us. And that word is anointed. But any time that you go through a revival like this, 
There is a stirring of that anointing for a purpose. A stirring of the anointing for a purpose. So I will call this freshness. There is some freshness that we have received. So don't let it go waste. We must put it to work. There is a lot to be done for the Lord. So much to be done for the Lord. When my friend and brother Atu, uh, Reverend Gatti was leading the worship, I was excited to see many of you raise hands and then make some moves. But the hands I saw were a lot of young people's hands. What if they moved on to make their moves on the street? What if they roll their sleeves and get to their ghettos? Look at how many people would have saved by the anointing. How many people would have saved by the anointing? The anointing is for a job to be done. Jesus did not come on the planet Earth to just save a few individuals. No. He has something that he has hatched. He was going to build this church. Now, these were going to be a community of people out of those who receive him. We did not receive him because we never met him. That is why the Bible says, as many as received him, we don't belong to that community. But as many as believed in his name, that is where all of us belong. So whether you received him like Peter or you believed in his name, we have been made a community out of that from the Jews and the Gentiles. And this new community is the church. Her responsibility is to continue from where Jesus left off. Israel's role as God's factor of transformation ended in Christ. And we began in Christ to continue from where Jesus Christ left off. There's so much work to be done, brothers and sisters. We need not to be comfortable here. There's work to be done. And let's come and receive. Let us go out there and discharge it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We must remember that the church has been anointed for a purpose. To advance the kingdom of God on the earth. What did I say? The church has been anointed for a purpose. And the purpose is to advance the kingdom of God onto the earth. So within the church, to zoom out the kingdom of God, the rule of God on the earth. So when we are a church in a nation, we must watch out whether God is ruling in the land. If God is not, then the church must cause that to happen because that is the mandate of the church. So anytime that we receive this stirring in our spirit, let us remember that we are building something. We are building a church. The anointing was to strengthen the church, to partner with Christ. The anointing was to strengthen the church, to partner with Christ, so that we will establish the kingdom of God here on earth, so that we can establish the kingdom of God here on earth. So I came to remind you that we are building something. We are building a strong, powerful church. For me, my definition of the church is this one. It's a community of holy people walking in love and advancing into the world with the gospel of salvation. A community of holy people walking in love and advancing onto the world with the gospel of salvation. It doesn't matter how you came in. This is a community of holy people. We may receive you anyway, anyhow, we all came with rough edges, but we don't continue in that because this is a community of holy people. None of us would have received the Holy Spirit of God. I'm not talking about even speaking in tongues. If we were not holy, no. The Holy Spirit would not have endured us. The day you accepted Jesus as Lord, you were purged and to be holy. That is how God sees you. See, sometimes when we are talking about evil, we tend to believe that we can do much more evil than to live a holy life. When we say live a holy life, what we are saying is that be who you are. Be who you are, the new creation. Just walk like a child of God. 
But we believe in walking like the child of, I don't want to say the devil. Yes, but the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, the old is gone. Let it be effectively gone. The new has come. Holiness means walk in the new. How many of us walk backwards like that? No, let's walk in the new. We are a community of holy people walking in love, conducting ourselves in certain ways that will bind us together in love and showing forth this love unto the world. Now, if you want to show something unto the world, don't show the holiness of God. That one, they will be afraid of it. Show them the love of God. And when they come, tell them that this is a holy place. Oh, yes, we walk in love. But that is not it. Advancing unto the world with the gospel of salvation. Because it's the power of God that saves. Shall we rise to our feet now? A holy community. A holy church. And we serve a holy God. Now just pay attention and look at me whilst you're still up. The object of worship is God, not me, not anybody. And sometimes we even worship our own selves. And these days that we come to church with all sort of electronic gadgets, people are here and they are worshiping to friends. So much irreverence because we have forgotten that we are before God. If you are before the Almighty, who is outside there that needs your attention? That sometimes you get before the Otufo and your phone is ringing and you do not want to pick. Sometimes you apologize that your phone disturbed your interaction with him. How much more the maker? We have lost sight of what we are doing. We are just churching. But this is a holy community worshiping a holy God. Now let me tell you this. The only sure difference between the church and any other organization or society is the holiness of God in the midst of us. There can be societies, but none of them will talk about holy except us. The, the only difference, clear difference between God and other laws and gods. How many of you are lords here? Let me see your hand. If you own a land, you are a lord. Yeah, if you have a building, you are Lord. That is why when you want to refer to God, we say the Lord of Lords, because many of you are lords. And we have kings. That is, we say the King of Kings. But you see, when we talk about holiness, Hannah says, There is none holy as the Lord. Shall we lift up our hands now? Begin to pray for a new orientation as to what we do here in church. And who we are worshiping, a holy community, walking in love and advancing unto the world with the gospel of salvation. Both satin, Birian the Basondo Kabai. Help us, O God. Let us understand this, Lord, that we will not just come to church worshiping ourselves, but we will worship you, the maker. We should come to church with this mentality that we are before the almighty God and that there is a the need for reverence. Spirit of God, Spirit of God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have your seats. And so, no matter who we are, the church is making a holy man, a woman out of you. Who we'll walk in love and then advance onto the world with the gospel of salvation. So we should know that we are building a church. We are building a holy church. We are building a loving church. We are building a church that is strong to be able to advance onto the community. We therefore need to be careful how we build. We need to be very, very careful how we build. You see, um, for me, some of the mistakes that I have made in life, especially as a minister, that has really hurt me and that I have so much regret for sometimes, were mistakes that... Uh, did not come because of my ignorance. For that one, I don't worry about that because I don't know uh, everything. And so when I make a mistake because I didn't know, that is okay. Sometimes we even post someone to 
um, a certain station with the anticipation that you will be able to perform and after a week or two, you hear some stories and you know that this one is a mistake. And so that one we will do it. And so at least I, will, I just take consolation from Jesus when he was selecting his team and he decided to select Judas. And so that at least you have one or two Judases amongst us. So sometimes we, we console ourselves with the Jesus' selection. Yeah, but, but, but those ones that have really, really pained me was when I was effectively advised, but I didn't take them. Yeah, those ones. Those ones, when you realize that your action was, is a mistake, it, it hurts the more. Especially, for me, the mistakes I made, and those ones that I was advised and I didn't take them, the people who gave me the advice, I saw them as people who didn't like me. So even before the West left their mouth, I have decided not to take it. Yeah. So these days I've repented. <laughs> Because I know that even the donkey can advise Balaam. And so when anyone is advising, whether you perceive the person to be a friend or enemy, it doesn't matter. You, you must listen to everyone. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, encourage us to listen to Tobiah. Yeah. He, well, how many of you have preached any good thing about Tobiah, Sambalat, and Geshem? Uh, so Tobiah is going to speak. Please listen to what he's going to say. Don't, don't rule Tobiah off because you may be like me. You have some regrets. So let's go to, I was going to say Tobiah chapter 4, but there's no Tobiah. And so Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building... Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. Now, let's listen to Nehemiah. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Father, hear, hear, hear. Hear what he is saying. And Lord, arise and give them over to us as a plunder. But you see that he didn't despise what he said. He didn't brush it away. So let's go back and pay attention to Tobiah. Now let's say that you enter into an exams hall. And then you, this statement confronts you on paper. And then they are asking you, what good can you say about this? especially those of you who are in the building industry, what will you say? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what they are building, even a force climbing up on it will break down their wall of stones. So they are building with what? Stones. And he says that even the wall of stones, this wall that they are building, when a force climbs on it, it will break the wall. Even though he was ridiculing them, what is he trying to say effectively? What lesson can we learn from what he has just said? Uh -huh. That we need to be concerned about the structural integrity of what we are building. Yeah. So that when foxes jump on them, it will not break. And we are building a church. We must be careful of the structural integrity of the church that we are building. We must be careful. The church that we are building. We need to build the church to be strong. We need to build the church to last. And we need to build this great church of ours. The P.I. of this is to spread. We need. So now I want to take, we need to build the church to be strong and powerful. When Jesus said, I will build my church, he said that he hinted that the gates of Hades will not be able to withstand it. So the very first day that he said, I'll build my church, he hinted that the church is going to have an opposition in the devil. So if the church is going to have an opposition in the devil himself, then the church must be built to be strong. Yeah. 
it must be built to be strong. See, when you study the Bible and you are following angels, some angels are not able to take some angels on. And so some of them, when they were confronted with the demons of Persia or the angel of Persia that supervised that region, this angel who was sent by God had to go back and call stronger ones. So when we talk about the devil himself, we must be strong. You see, sometimes we even fear demons. This one is not demon. No. The gaze of the devil himself should not be able to withstand the onslaughts of the church. And Jesus' idea was this. It isn't that the church was going to be defending itself against the gates of hell. But he says that the gates of hell will not be able to stand against it. What that means is that the church must be an advancing church. The church militant to the stand. And when they get to where the gates is, the gates must open to it. Yeah. I like our forebears. When they sang, say, you cut to a bronze and walk with one. See, for they, they were not afraid like we do in church today. They didn't come to church talking about demons. We went to church somewhere, I was seated back there, and this elder took the mic. Let's, uh, I'm be our ambassador here meeting. And the home was becoming too much. You see, as for their home, we can't do anything about our homes. Yeah. Even witches and wizards. Yeah, see, we come to church with them. They are with them at our workplaces. It is their food we buy in the market. And then sometimes you think that this one is not a market, it's a nice shop you are buying from a witch or a wizard. Now listen, forget about them. They are there. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. This is what we must major on. And not demons. So you go to churches and they want to even sell and give out anointing oils. For what? If the anointing on you, the Holy Spirit cannot help you, what else can help you? We are just disturbing the church. We are disturbing the church. This is not the church of God. We need to measure on what is in us. And then they, they themselves on the fagging. That is what we were taught. Please. So don't, let us build a church that is strong. The church must be strong because it has a position in the devil. The church must be strong so that it should be able to answer questions. Tough questions. Questions that are on people's mind that they don't have solution to. The church should answer it. The church should be able to meet needs and solve problems. The church should meet needs and solve problems. People should not come here with need. When the doctors have written her out and they've told her you are going to die, this is where the game must change. Yeah. It is the most powerful institution on earth. There is none like that. That is why one day Eli told his sons, if somebody has a, a case against another, God will intervene. But if you have a case against God, who will plead for you? You see, in here in the church, God is with us. So Paul says, who can be against us? This is how strong the church should be. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel that we even preach. It is the power of God that liberates humans. It's the power of God that liberates humanity. The church must be built to be strong and powerful. You see, and when we come to church, here, yeah, there must be deliverance. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 17. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 17. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. The word Zion, Mount Zion, is used figuratively. But today in the New Testament, when we talk about Zion, we mean the church. So in the church, it must be so powerful to answer questions, meet needs, and solve problems. There must be deliverance. So when we are coming to church, leaders of the church should understand that people are coming with burdens. So but there must be a lot of preparation before 
people come and join us. We need to raise prayer altars. We need to raise prayer warriors. Even those who of us who sing. See, we are singing to bless people. So that our singing will meet needs, answer questions, and solve problems. We must sing under the move and the anointing of the Spirit. Those of us who play the instruments, the anointing does not rest on keyboards. It rests on the one behind the keyboard. That is how we should all prepare and come. When you are even coming to church, don't just come. Come prepared and eager to receive. So that there's fire from here and fire from there. And there will be deliverance. There will be deliverance. We need to build a church to be strong. Verse 21, Obadiah 1, 21. Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau. Now, so we come here and there is deliverance. So those of us who are delivered, we don't remain in Zion. We go out of Zion with strength and we go and govern Esau, representing the world. I see a lot of deliverers here. You need to deliver your spheres. Deliver your spheres. You see, you have come to us. I don't wake up in the morning, go into the ministry of finance. What am I going to do? Once in a while, I go there <laughs> if I need to go there. I don't wake up in the morning, go into the education office. What am I going to do? Am I a teacher? Yeah. But you see, this morning, all of you have come to us. All of you from the Ministry of Agriculture, from the Unemployment Association, you are welcome. Yeah. You see how powerful the church is? And when you come here and there is deliverance, you then move into your spheres and go and change the place. That is why people come to church. And this, we must drum home. This is why people come to church. You see all of you from various spheres, there are nurses here, there are policemen. You go out there and change your sphere. That is why you come to church. Number two, we need to build a church to last. We need to build a church to last. First Corinthians 3, from 9 to 12. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I lay a foundation as a wise builder. And someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care. What we are seeing today is a product of yesterday's church. But those of us in this era, we must also build with care because of tomorrow's church. Must. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Which is Jesus Christ. Verse 12. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their works, verse 13, will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Yeah. So we ought to be careful how we build because it is going to be tested. Now, when you are putting up a building, always remember that the rains will come, the streams will rise, the wind will blow, and it will test the quality of your building. You see, winds do not have eyes, so they cannot excuse a certain building. Because the foundation is poor. Yeah. The rains will not excuse any building. So whether you build on the sand or you build on the rock, according to Matthew chapter 7, the rains will come. And it will test the quality of the building. So let us build with care. Let us build the church to last. Now. Why should we Build the check to last. I'll go back and, and ask, why should leaders 
be mindful of tomorrow. The problem we have, or the problem some nations have, is because their leaders are not mindful of tomorrow. You make someone a leader today, and by the next month, he changes his car. Even the chief. Because somebody will come and say, oh, we there in fatal, nana, we in fatal. And then he leaves his small car, and then he goes for V8. So that will make him a chief. If leadership is just about what we will have today, then that is not leadership. That is why we are suffering in some nations. That is why. Leadership is always about tomorrow. So I will take all of you here to be leaders of the church today. Don't look at me. You are part of the leadership. We should know that we are building this church to last. So we must be careful how we are building. Why should leaders be mindful of tomorrow's church? Number one, human beings expire. We don't live forever. How many of you here will not die? You see, the only problem we have is that we don't even factor death in our planning. If this one is a sure, sure, sure for all of us. <laughs> Yet when we are planning, we don't bring in death. I ask someone, when do you think you like to die? And then <laughs> he looked at my face. <laughs> he couldn't answer my question. <laughs> so I will leave you to go and answer this question. When do you think you want to die? I met this man who has built a house for us. And then I went there to dedicate it because of a big house, big church building, and what he had done for the community was marvelous. So I asked him about this president that he used to work for in Nigeria. And then um, I said, this man should be around 85 years. He's old, but he looks strong. And this elder told me that that man planned to live long. That man, he planned to live long. Yeah. If you die today, when we come, we will still find a message to preach. Yeah. 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 But if you don't want to die today, then even, even Jesus, when the people took stones, and they wanted to stone him, he knew that this was not the time to die. Because this is not the cross. You see, stones are not crosses. And so, there is no way he should allow himself to be killed by these people. If they stone him to death, God will say, ah, wash. <laughs> we brought you to come and hang on the tree. You let these people knock your head with stones. So he sneaked through. It wasn't once, so twice. And because it is twice, it means that all of us must learn from it. Because out of any two or three witnesses shall everything be established. Now, if you're a diabetic and the doctor is saying, please be mindful of this. Don't say that, but, but uh, me condo. Yeah. Now, if you die too early, <laughs> I'm sure some of you, the angels will beat you before they accept you to heaven. <laughs> because there's so much to be done here. And so plan, please plan, plan. Because you don't die for yourself. When you die too early, look at the implications on their family. And so let us all try. I'm not preaching about death. One day I'll come and talk about that. Yeah, but please remember that human beings expire. We don't live forever. Number two, there is a limit to what all of us can do and how far we can go. So anytime that we are working, we must think of how the church will progress when we are not there. Because there's a limit to how much we can do and how far we can go. Number three, we all live in a certain space and time. We all live. Sometimes when we say live, I'm talking about the strength of what you can do just within a certain space and time. No generation can possibly finish the work of God. Because every day, fresh sinners are born. No generation can possibly finish the work of God because as I speak, a fresh sinner has been born even unto an apostle. Yeah. Yeah. Apostle's child is a fresh sinner. 
So people are born and you can't possibly finish this work. So we must always think about how the church is going to be like tomorrow. Now every generation comes with its own challenges. And it takes the people of that same generation to deal with the challenges. So when you don't belong to a certain generation, you can't possibly deal with the challenges of that generation. We always have to raise people who will be able to be dealing with the challenges, anticipated challenges. Now, from what I've said, I want to respectfully ask Adavuete to come. Adavuete, trustee of the Church of Lenticus. <laughs> he spent his life working for this church. And so sometimes, when you want to mention his name, you inadvertently you say, Apostle Buete, I, <laughs> you take it back now. The first presiding elder of this church, when he was even working at the bank, he would still come out and set some speakers out there and still preach, preach around the post office across Central. He interpreted for James McKeon a number of times. He has done a lot. But you see, we are building a church that should last. Because of that, if you are thinking about the tomorrow's church, we can't possibly take him to tomorrow. No. He has done his part, but we can't take him into the future. So if every day we come to church and he is a preacher, we'll be losing tomorrow's church. So as we move on, some will have to be slowing now once we give space for other people because we are building the church to last. Yes. Respectfully, can you sit down? Shall we put our hands together for him? Let's put our hands together for him. When God instructed Israel to possess the nations, he didn't have in mind old people because it was going to be battle against the nations. Even though every individual Israelite was a priest unto God. So they will play a role but not the possessing. Yeah. Not the battle. No, not the battle. Joshua chapter 13 verse 1. This is one of my favorite tests. And I want us to please uh, join me in Joshua 13 verse 1. When Joshua had grown old, the Lord said to him, You are now very old, and there are still very large areas of land to be taken over. Joshua is now what? Very old. Now, if you have to read the heart of God behind this statement, you realize that God wished that Joshua had not aged the way he has. Yeah. Because he's been a factor in his hands. And now he's old. But there are still, God is saying, still a lot of lands yet to be taken over. But Joshua could have done that when he was younger. But now he's old. He's old. Now if Joshua in chapter 13, the Bible is saying, is saying he's old. I'm sure by chapter 24 he'll be dead. Oh? Okay, let's go to 24. Chapter 24. But I want us to look at this. Chapter 24, let's go to 29. 29. 29. And I want us to read together if we can. Please, let's stand up if you are comfortable with that. After, can you see? No. You're okay. After these things... Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. Fine. Let's read on. So Joshua is dead. Huh? Fine. 30. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Tisma, Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. So he's been buried. Now pay attention to this one. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua. 
Sometimes you have been blaming Joshua. But look at it. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who had lived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. Now hold this. So the elders who have experienced what the Lord has done for Israel, they were able to serve the Lord. Now let's jump the next verse. The next verse will talk about the bones of Joseph. So let's move on. So in Joseph's bones, now let's go to the next one, 33. Now this is where I want you to grab something. And Eliezer, son of Aaron. Who is this Aaron? Aaron is Moses' brother. You, you know that Joshua was Moses' boy. And so I want to suggest to you that Moses and Aaron were contemporaries. And so Eliezer and Joshua will also be contemporaries. Would that be okay? Yeah, fine. So, and so now we saw that Joshua is dead. And Moses is dead. And Aaron is dead. So once Joshua died, all things being equal, soon Eliezer will have to die. We came onto this planet Earth in groups. So you don't have any idea. <laughs> and we live in groups. Yeah. We came in generations, and we shall live in generations. All things being equal. Sometimes maybe per accident or something, somebody dies a bit early. But otherwise, when you die around 80 or something, give all your colleagues plus minus 10. All of them will come and meet you wherever you are. So we die in groups. Now, so we must be mindful of generations. So when we are building churches, be mindful of generations. And Eliezer, son of Aaron, died and was buried at Gibeah, which had been allotted to his son Phinehas in the hill country of Ephraim. So a whole generation is going to be with the Lord. Now, Judges chapter 2, verse 10. Sometimes, let's practice standing a bit. Don't worry. Don't mind me. I'll soon be finished. Judges 2. After the whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, that whole generation. So the Moses generation is gone a long time. And the Joshua generation has been gathered to their fathers. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what had been done for Israel. There is going to be trouble. There is going to be trouble. You go to UK, please sit down. And on this day, Sunday, yesterday, Saturday, that Friday, even Mondays, whether it is morning or afternoon, people go to the park, football field with their children. The man is in Jesse's shirt, the wife is in Jesse's shirt, the grandmother is in Jesse's shirt, and the two boys are in Jesse's shirt. Yeah. Chelsea, Chelsea's shirt, I should say. Because I, I don't support them, so that is why. I, I should have said Liverpool shirt. <laughs> yeah. What are they doing? But all their churches are locked. But they worship soccer. And they are telling their boys that this is where you belong. Even that, that, that jersey that the boy is wearing is informing the mind. You also grow up to be a Liverpool fan. And you will not depart from the field. This thing to me. If we really want to build this church to last, we need to be careful about the tomorrow's church. God knew this. So when he gave the laws to Israel, he told them, impress it upon your children and your children's children so that that link is not broken. Now when we come to church, don't let us make this mistake. Don't allow the children to go straight to the Sunday school. Don't. And then they will go and do their own thing and then they never come here. So when they are grown and you want them to be here, they don't enjoy this place. Why do you have to separate teenagers, say teen service? For what? 
For what? Because these teens, once they enter secondary school, you yourself, you don't find them in the house. They spend most of their time in school. So they don't come to service. When they vacate, you still want them to be there. And you call it teens church. And so they will only be used to school kind of service. So when they come here and we sing in some, some songs, they say, ah, this one, this one, this one. And they want to leave and go to a church that the people are always jumping. And they go there and they think that that is a good church. That is better than ours. We are effectively destroying tomorrow's church. That is not church at all. As chapter 21, verse 5. Let's look at church. As 21, 5. And when it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, that is the church, including wives and the church includes wives and children, accompanied us out of the city. And there on, there on the beach, we knelt and prayed. When they were praying, did the children also knew? Yes. Church always includes children. Now, what I want to suggest to all of us is this. Start service with the children. Sing the choruses with them. Let them know about some of the songs we sing. Let them hear Ahampony Nesro. You let them hear. Let them hear it. Let them hear all the songs. Let, let us do the worship together with them. If they have a choir, let the choir sing. See, when children have choirs, they don't want to sing to themselves. There is no child who is interested in singing to the colleague. They are interested in singing at where Dada is. So that Dada will know that, me too, I can sing. That is their pride. That is it. Children, their pride is not in their colleagues. It's in their parents. But when they grow and they are, they are going to have a wedding, then you see that the parent also, his pride is in the son. You see, when my son was going to, was going to wed, and I entered the church house, you see, I knew that, I, you see, the, the pride, I was more proud than him. No, 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 no. Ah, you have produced a son. I produced a son. So I was walking like this. I was walking like that. That day, the glory does not go to the bride or the bridegroom. You don't have any idea. It is to the parents. But when they are young, they always want to sing to us. Teens, that level, we shouldn't separate them. If you want to separate the teens, let it be once a while. Okay. Once a while. So when we have all worship, we can then decide to break into tracks. Teens means meeting. Children's meeting. The adults. Let them go and finish close. Let them come and say, the fire is here. here. Okay. Let them come and say it here. You see? Let them come and say it here. Don't think that when the children come, they will disturb us. Let them disturb us. They are part of the church. Let them come and disturb us. They are part of the church. And normally when a child is seated by the parent, the child will be quiet. Yeah. So don't group them at a place. Once you group them, they will talk. But let them sing, sit among us. You see that if he wants to talk to his friend, he will just do this. But he can't talk. <laughs> because the parents are amongst them. So they can't talk. So let us be careful what we do. What we do. Yeah. Psalm 78. Psalm 78 from verse 1. My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things. Things from of old. Things we have heard and known. Things our ancestors have what told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. 
we will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed status for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. The next verse. So the next generation will, will know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn will tell their children. The next verse. Then they will put their trust in God and will not forget his deeds, but will keep his commands. The next one, the powerful one. They will not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. So if we don't bring these children and youth close to us, there can be a generational gap, and no one will feel it. By that time, you will be old and aged. And then when you advise them, they will think that you are an old man. You'll be frustrated in your old age. We should have started a bit earlier. We need to bridge the gap. Now, for, for us, those of us who have families, we, we, we all do not just die. We continue to live in a way through our descendants. And your first church is your home. If you cannot sit your wife and your kids down for prayer, you are destroying your church in your house. That is why a number of us are here, but our children do not follow us to church. Sometimes they are in some other churches. Say, come here, say, hey, yeah, our church too is good. Why is your child saying that? If you think that here is good, why is your child saying that our church too is good? When did your child have another church? Why, what happened? What do you say about the church of Pentecost at home? Why? If you sat with your wife and your children and you did it consistently, praying together, teaching them, asking some of them to, to teach, to preach, and to pray together, that would have not happened. It wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen at all. At all. That wouldn't happen. I pray that God will help us. I met this man who had presided for 25 years, con constantly 25 years. No break. I met him with the pastor. And then when he saw me, he said, oh, apostle, this is about some five or six years ago. I went back to certain district. Then he says, please, tell my pastor to review me because I'm tired. I've presided for 25 years continuous. And the man even presided me. So he's old. Only that he's not an old man, so to speak. He, he, he still has strength. When he became a presiding elder, he was young. But he has presided for 25 years. So I decided to, I couldn't possibly tell the pastor that, review him. That is not what we do. Because I don't know whether there is the need on the ground. And so I didn't say that. But I asked his elder, where is your big boy? And because I knew him, but for many years, uh, I've not seen him. Not knowing that the boy was working with him. He's now grown. He's, he has a, his PhD. He teaches at the University of Cape Coast. And I said, what? Then I asked about the second. And I asked about the third. See, the social ladder that these ones have climbed, the father who was a hawker, hawker. The father was a hawker. But because of his commitment, God has also blessed his children. So I just told him that if I were you, I'll continue for another 25 years. And we all laughed and then I sneaked out. But you see, whilst I was moving away from them, I was a bit sad. Because one person should not preside for 25 years. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. 
in the late 70s to early 80s, very early 80s, I think Bob Marley died in 81. His music was almost capturing the whole world. And then the young people started dressing like him and singing the reggae song. And the reggae song was knocking at the doors of the church. The reggae music, not the song per se, but the music was knocking. Because when you are a Christian or you are an unbeliever, it doesn't matter who you are. When you sat in the trotro, somebody will let you hear Bob Marley's song. And it was all over. It was around that time that the reggae music found itself in the church. And our pastors were not comfortable with that at all. With my own naked eyes. Living young people. My contemporaries. I was a bit older than them. They were, they were dancing in church. They just jumped into it like that. And then you see the reggae was like this. It was like that. And then these young men and then the musicians. Oh, they played for them. Then the pastor took the bell, our traditional bell. Then he rang it, and he stopped them in their tracks. Now listen, young people, what they don't like is embarrassment. And so he stopped them like that. And then these guys, they started, they went to sit down. But you see, amongst any community of people, they always have a leader. Then their leader said, I will not join this church. I can't be here. They got very angry. Very angry. And they left the church. They left the church. Try it as we did. I remember how to come from my station to go and convince these guys. I thought I could do it. But I realized that I've come too late. I've come. I had it just about, after about a year. And so they found themselves in certain places and they wouldn't come. That is the reason why he is still precise. Those young men who could have filled the gap, they left the church. Now listen. We are building this church to last. We must be careful of tomorrow's church. We must be careful of the young people. Give them space in the church. Let them preach in the church. Let them, let, give them space. When it is youth meeting, let the elderly people come and supervise them. Come and check how many of them came to church. Show your interest about tomorrow's church. Show your interest about tomorrow's church. Because we need to build this church to last. <laughs> I will put a comma here. And then I will come back some other time. But let me conclude with this statement by E. Pinto. Shall we read together? The society that hates its youth has no future. The society that hates its youth or its young has no future. And orient them. Don't let them just do whatever they like. Wisely guide them. Wisely guide them. And when they come to church and they are jumping, let them jump. Because they could have been jumping in the disco. That if by God's grace they are jumping in church, why don't we thank God for their life? And for how long would they be able to jump? Yeah. How long? You see, when we were, when we were boys, ours was, it was wilder than what they are doing. We, we didn't dance on the two feet. No, we didn't do that. We danced just on one foot. And then this one will go around like that. <laughs> and today, you try, I, I don't even have to try. Because I cannot. I cannot. Yeah. Sometimes when they are doing it, I only remember those days. But you see, it's just, just about remembering those days. Let them do it. If they wear their tattered jeans and come, let them come. As they grow, they will grow out of tattered jeans. Yes. Let us encourage them to come. Let them come. And then we also be, have to be careful of building tomorrow's church. I'm soon going to ask you to sing and to dance. But the way you dance, I didn't like the way you dance. 
if you are still dancing, separating men and women in this generation, what would the tomorrow's church be? Hmm? And I don't expect it to happen here. No, 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 no. Now, now, how many of you can define the theory of separating women and men from dancing? Why? Why? I cannot answer. So don't put me in trouble. Now, when you keep doing this, you are effectively destroying tomorrow's check because the young people will not understand this formula. Where did you get them? So listen, we are building this check to last. We are building it to be strong against the future. And we need to be mindful of tomorrow's church. When you stand up there and you are an elderly person and you are ministering, know that 70% of the church of Pentecost are youth and children. Be careful what you say. Don't preach as if you are talking to the aged. Because among the congregation are the youth. Tailor the message to meet their needs and their aspirations. Tailor the message. Shall we rise to our feet now?